All right. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Shell Little. I'll be your moderator for today. I apologize in advance. Um, so my intentions uh, today are to start my timer that I need to run right now. Um, OK, so I'm going to introduce myself, our panel, and then our panelists. So uh, a little bit about me. I'm a digital accessibility specialist. I work at Wells Fargo DS4B, meaning I work on the corporate side. Um, on my team, I am the inclusive design lead and the mobile lead. So all mobile projects have to go through me. Um, I'm incredibly passionate about gaming. I'm a streamer. Uh, I stream on Mixer. Go, Mixer! Uh, and I'm super pumped to be here today. Um, flew in from Seattle. Jet lag is painful, but here we are. <laughs> um, so a little bit about our panel, which I know Tara gave us a little bit of an intro, but something that I'm really excited about today is not only are the lovely people up here on stage um, gamers with disabilities, but we're also subject matter experts, experts, specialists, and we're also advocates. So not only are we people who experience barriers, but we're also people teaching about those barriers. So the perspectives that we have are pretty unique when it comes to cognitive, uh, and it's really exciting. So I'm, I'm glad that we're all up here and, and hanging out. So um, something that's kind of fun is we're the kind of people that surprise, delight, and maybe frustrate uh, designers and developers because we're the neurodiverse group of people that make other developers, designers, and people recognize the fact that assistive technology and things that are built for a particular user, neurodiverse people use. We're screen reader users. We are people who use voice to text. We are the people who need controller mapping as well. So it's really fun that we're all up here together to talk about kind of the unique perspective that we have. So uh, above me, I have um, pictures of everybody. And I also have um, some contact information. I'm going to turn around and look. Um, so I have a Cherry. Uh, then I have Jamie. And then I also have Steven. So I'm going to say, uh, go ahead, Steven, if you want to introduce yourself. And then we'll just kind of go down the line from there. Cool. Um, so my name is Steven Woodgate. Um, I've had uh, 15 years working in technology. Um, so everything from uh, working for uh, Microsoft and Dell, um, predominantly um, working also for some tech agencies uh, recently to build different solutions welcome to gaming. My kind of experience of gaming is actually one of one getting frustrated. So my invisible disability is that I'm severely dyslexic, but I've also got speech dyspraxia. So you may not hear it, but I'm stumbling in my head like, every time I speak. So um, I'm speaking a lot slowly in terms of the process of information. So I'm a huge advocate for accessibility gaming to understand about how to simplify communication and make games much more effective and simple to play. <coughs> Hi, um, I'm Cherry. I am looking at my notes because I have really severe memory problems. Um, but I live in Vancouver despite my weird accent, and I'm also very jet lagged. We flew together. It was really fun. Um, so I actually have a background in film and photography and uh, art and design. But uh, I had to leave that career uh, about s almost seven years ago and find a new career. I found that in gaming. It was really amazing. I'm giving a talk on that at Accessibility Toronto this week. It's going to be very emotional. Um, but I started as a subject matter expert. In fact, at one of the biggest things I did was, um, in the beginning, an inclusive design sprint for the coalition. And the developers of the coalition believed in me and told me I could be a developer if I wanted it. And so, one more to get emotional. Um, they encouraged me to learn game design, which I did. And today, fast forward, I'm now a developer and a game designer and a accessibility specialist in UX and systems design, because I'm a really big nerd. <laughs> um, I run workshops, collaborative design meetings, and audits of products at uh, particular milestones, like important early milestones. I've worked in AAA and Indie. Here's some quick examples. I worked at Media Molecule on Dreams, Gorilla Games on Unannounced, uh, Crystal Dynamics on Marvel Avengers, which is a big one, and at Ubisoft. And then Indies like Gambrinus on Cardpocalypse, which you should all play. It was developed in Ireland, and it's freaking amazing, and I love the main character. <laughs> Uh, hello. Uh, I'm going to keep staring this way as much. <laughs> hello, guys. Hi. Uh, I'm Jamie. This is Laya. Um, I work for the BBC. Uh, I'm a senior research engineer, which basically means I break things from my job. Um, one way to describe what I do is I pee on all the fires, basically, <laughs> the accessibility fires. It's my job to pee on them. Um, 
On that note, Gareth is here. He's my line manager. He's going to tell me if I'm fired or not. Um, <laughs> thumb up mean fired or thumb down mean fired? Ah! Uh, and he's also got the most important line. Uh, this is not the opinion of the BBC. So now I'm free to say freaking anything. It's great. Let's go. Let's go. Um, yeah, there we go. So uh, I do some gaming stuff. I mostly do web accessibility, digital accessibility, and I am autistic. There we go. Awesome. Um, so to wrap up our intros, um, obviously I talked a little bit about my professional uh, and my personal life. Um, I am, I have ADHD. I have uh, dyslexia, dyscalculia, and a lot of other fun big words that go along with uh, who I am. Uh, definitely ADHD forward. So if you see me hiding somewhere, <laughs> you know, that's how it is. Um, but it definitely, all of us come with very different backgrounds, very different disabilities. Um, but there are a lot of similarities, and as Tara mentioned, there are a lot of differences. So when you're thinking about people with cognitive disabilities, we definitely do not fit into a clean box. We are all very unique and very different. So uh, on that note, I'd like to start our first question. So for our first question, I just want to talk about the subject of sliding ability scales. Um, so a lot of people in the disability you know, community understand the concept of sliding ability scales, where what you can do at noon you oftentimes cannot do at 8 o'clock at night. Um, so you know, for those people who understand that, it's obviously pretty normal. But when we're talking about cognitive, what I can do and what we can do in the morning does change because depending on thousands and just limitless um, possibilities of what happens throughout our day, it will definitely weigh on us, take cognitive load, and we end up out of steam by the end of the day. Um, people who are privy to spoon theory, we're out of spoons. Um, so let's see. So with that uh, kind of understanding, I'd like to ask my question of when your cognitive needs are at their highest, um, or out of spoons, um, what is your go-to game or gameplay? So what do you go for? Jamie, I'll, we'll start with you. Uh, so my one is I really like racing games because they're repetitive and structured. Um, but they have to be something like Forza rather than Forza Horizons. Because Forza Horizons, you can go anywhere in the world. <laughs> no idea. But go around this track until, you, until you're sick. That works really well. Um, one of the things I'm really happy with recently is um, on iOS 13, you can now use an Xbox controller. And they also ported Grid to iOS. So there's now a proper sim racing game on iOS. So if I carry an Xbox controller on my phone, I can access that anytime I want, which is really fun but terrible for my productivity. <laughs> um, so yeah, I like the repetition. The repetition is the main thing. It's structured. There's no surprises. Um, and most of them have also got a rewind function. So when I to do totally screw it up, I can just rewind things. I could do one of those in real life, but the physicists are working on it. The R&D at the BBC, very busy. Oh, good. Um, yeah, so that's me. Sherry? Um, I'm weird. Hello. Um, we should I, get t-shirts. We should get t-shirts. I'm just weird. Um, I actually didn't talk about my disabilities, which is really unusual for me because I'm an oversharer. Um, but I am autistic. I have ADHD. I have everything that goes with that, like dyslexia, dyspraxia. All of that comes with it. Um, I also have had strokes, so those have impacted my cognitive ability, which is why my memory is so bad. So everything I lived with growing up got worse. Um, I know I'm weird because Destiny is one of the most inaccessible games to have ever existed, but it's my go-to game when I don't have energy because once I got over those bumps, for me, um, accessibility isn't about can or can't, it's often about impact and whether that's going to cause a meltdown, whether it's going to burn me out, whether it's going to overload me or hurt me, um, which I do get a lot of pain associated with all those things and my physical disabilities. Um, but once I got over those bumps when I first got into Destiny, um, now I have a routine, and it's a game full of routines. Like every day you have like a set number of things you can do, and you get to go do those things. And then days where I can't, there's so many things you can do. Days where I can't decide because I have really severe problems with decision fatigue and I just cannot make decisions, I can play with my partner, and he can drive and make the decisions, and I just go along for the ride and kill thousands of aliens, and it's really fun. <laughs> Steven? Um, for me, with the um, information overloads that you can often get from games as well, I'd, I often like to strip back to old basic arcade games. Um, one of my most favourite is Worms or Worms Armageddon. You know, really simple, effective, a lot of fun, a really sociable game as well, so which you can come through, but it actually makes you think much more. 
uh, strategically in things. So when there's an overload of information, actually enough in something we think about and where other people have goes, so you can actually have that time to actually think about it, actually saves me a lot of time, which is really good. And um, I'm a big FIFA advocate as well, so um, trying to be uh, I know, Harry Kane and trying to score loads of goals can not always be quite handy. Um, and I would say for me, um, it's that's a struggle. Like this, quite, I wrote this question, and I have a hard time answering it um, because having an attention-related disability, when you're out of, you know, out of steam, and at the end of the day, and my you know, cognitive needs are high, it's it's almost impossible to pay attention to anything. So paying attention to a game can be very difficult. Um, but I have found games that you're able to play with friends. It makes the attention. It's not a task to play. It's part of an adventure and it's part of team play. So um, I'm strictly a Nintendo player, um, which I was going to ask you guys what you play, but you know, I, I got thrown out. But um, as a Nintendo player, uh, I have found a lot of joy in Splatoon. I don't play shooter games, I don't play games with guns. That's just what I say on my stream. Um, but paint, now that's a little bit different. So um, there is a PVE mode uh, called Salmon Run that I find so much joy in putting friends on comms, on Discord, and just playing. So it's, it's repetitive, it's pattern-based, it's very formulaic. So it's, you know, you, once you know the controls, you're good to go. But it took me forever to get even competent in the game. And I, I think it was just perseverance that I don't normally find in myself, because I was like, I want to be good at this game. And when I say good, I mean able to actually play and not die for 30 seconds. So I achieved that. <laughs> um, so on that note, um, when we're talking about game mechanics, um, sometimes when we talk about cognitive disabilities, people uh, find it interesting that when there's user, you know, user experience design and when we build usable products and there are like <coughs> nice to haves when we think about those, oftentimes those are things that for someone with a cognitive disability, those are make or break. So being able to use spell checker in a game, being able to use something that um, helps you understand time better. Those things, they're nice, and I, I can think a lot of web examples because I work in web, like being able to have something that remembers your password for you, having something that you can, you know, a form field you can paste into. Those things become assistive technology, and they become things that break down barriers for us, even though some people would just think of them as, oh, that's just a good, nice to have kind of thing. So my question for everybody would be, um, if I can find it on here, is there like a mechanic in a game or something you find in a game that makes them more playable, more enjoyable, more accessible for you guys that wouldn't traditionally be thought of as an accessibility feature? Which, on that note, Cherry loves to say, there are no such thing as accessibility features because everything helps everyone. So on that note, um, we'll start with Steven. Yeah, um, one of the interesting um, elements which uh, maybe not everyone think of is like black and white mode. So things actually turn in, turn in all colours off. Um, especially with my uh, dyslexia, colours actually translate and confuse a lot of um, thinking patterns that actually comes through. People who actually, a lot of people who have dyslexia like reading stuff off a green background as an example. However, when it's like a specific task which I need to, to focus on, whether that's on um, a laptop or a phone, often turn it into black and white, just so I can actually focus on what's on hand. So if there's a game with a particularly really tricky task, actually all the distractions, whether that's color, notifications, people joining the game, online menus, actually acts as a deterrent for me to actually be enjoyable the game and actually find it overwhelming. So actually having that kind of function, the simple black and white version, even if it's just to get through the smallest of tasks or boss or a really complicated scenario, actually would be a lot of benefit to me. Cherry? Yeah, so as Shell said, I love this question because I am the person that always comes up on stage and like throw everything out that you know because all features are accessibility features. Um, I really want us to move past as an industry, past the idea of these are for disabled people and this is for everyone else. I really want us to be inclusive as possible in our approach and understand that any feature in a game could potentially have accessibility impacts. Um, and that disabled people don't need special accommodations. Um, they just need to actually be included in the core pillars of our design and how we approach games design. Because games design is about creating barriers. So we just have to be deliberate in that approach and understand who we might be excluding in that approach. So with that in mind, um, 
a few years ago, Horizon Zero Dawn came out, and um, I really struggled with that game at first, and I was super bummed because I was so excited. I love robots because I am a very stereotypical autistic person um, in some ways. But um, I struggled, and I'm really good at games. Like That sounds like bragging, but I've played games for over 35 years because I'm older than I look, and I've played them a lot. And I couldn't play it, even on like normal, because there's no such thing as normal. Um, but what really helped me was there was something called training grounds, which were not meant as practice areas. They were not meant to be a place to go practice your skills. They were meant to be a place to like earn achievements and prove yourself. I think they were actually called proving grounds, now that I think about that. Um, I use them as practice areas. And I got really freaking good at the game. And now I've completed it on ultra hard mode. like four times. So it's really, it's unusual. This is why I became a systems designer, basically, is because all these systems really contribute to accessibility in a really fundamental way beyond settings. And I really think that's the future of accessibility. I'm trying to wrap up. Go on, Jamie. I'm really sorry I ramble. No, no, you're good. That's cool. Um, I ramble, too. So here we go. Um, so for me, it's anything that adds structure. So structure is the main thing that I miss in games. So um, a couple of examples could be things like uh, in Forza Horizon, you can filter the map to the championship I'm currently in. That changed the game from something I could pick up and play with or something I go, oh, actually, I need to do that another day. So that got me in the door. Um, another one is I'm in love with the pause button mm -hmm. because it buys me time. So I love being able to pause things and think for a moment. Or sometimes, uh, so for example, if I'm playing you know, Gears of War or something, I'll get through a thing. That was freaking brilliant. Ah! Pause, have a moment, wait for my peripheral vision to come back, mm -hmm. then go again. So the pause button and being able to play with time can be really useful. They're not, they're not necessarily obvious, but once you think about things in terms of what is adding complexity um, and what is messing with time, those are the sorts of features that work well for me. Mm -hmm. I actually use the pause a lot. Sometimes I leave it on pause for like an hour just mm -hmm. to decompress. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. No, that resonates a lot with me as well, where you know, sensory processing disorder or something else that, um, you know, I have in my day-to-day, -day, being able to pause and get that peripheral vision back because mm. we get our own tunnel vision. We don't need it at all in your game. Like, yeah. and we're already dealing with it IRL. Um, so having that pause button. But um, to also to note off of what Cherry said, um, I found great joy. Uh, granted, I hit a barrier and stopped playing it because I abandoned games and that's who I am as a person. But playing Bayonetta, when it did get, or when I was able to play it on Switch, um, it did have, when you would purchase new moves, you just had a really safe ground where you were able to play. You weren't taking damage, um, which is so overwhelming. So being able to remember the controls, because that's like Cherry mentioned, like we say, like learning is the hardest part. Like that's the biggest barrier is just getting through the learning, remembering the buttons. So when you try to play Bayonetta and then you go to Smash and it's the same character and they're totally different controls and you die a thousand times, having that space where you're able to be safe and just play um, is really beneficial. I've got a, a similar one, mm -hmm. which is at the start of Call of Duty, there's like a thing that you can run around and shoot things and you get like 43 seconds. Um, that turned a shooting game into a driving game for me because I could mm. just do laps of it. Uh -huh. So I used to do that a lot. Or the first, the starting plateau on Zelda, uh, Breath of the Wild, mm -hmm. I'll just take a new gameplay and hit that, hit it over and over mm -hmm. and over again. I so ultimately, turn everything into a racing game. Yeah, I think that's actually why I like Destiny because a lot of things are structured within a bubble, and you do that bubble, and you can breathe for a bit, and then do another bubble. Yeah. Hmm, Destiny. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so um, on that note, we're going to move to our next question, which is something that I'm excited to take time on. We're doing great on time, so we can discuss Ooh. this one. Um, and it's about, let's see, next time. Like, I got confused about what's, because it's behind me. See, huh? Um, <laughs> there we go. It should be about overstimulation. Um, so when it comes to our types of disabilities and, you know, who we are, we, as people, deal with overstimulation, mm -hmm. overprocessed, over burnt out fried. Okay, I just got to say, it's really freaking hot in here. Like, yeah, right? It's really, uh -huh. has anyone else noticed? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I feel bad. Um, so it affects everybody differently. We all have experienced kind of this overload and overstimulation diff like differently for me. With my sensory processing, um, it's very visually based. So um, when I'm being bombarded with visual information, it's really overwhelming. And it will, um, the joke that I like to make is with sensory processing disorder, it's like you're eyes are making phone calls and your brain's not picking up. 
So nothing is processed. I can see clinically, but the brain, if your brain's not processing it, it's like your eyes are closed. So for me being um, just bombarded with damage alerts and um, bloody screen, so real, like those are really difficult for me. Um, and I struggle with that for visual overstimulation. Um, but for you guys, is there any type of overstimulation that you experience in games? And if you're comfortable talking about it, um, would you please describe what it's like to go through that as a player? Something that I think is really important. We hear, don't do these things, but to hear from us, what is it actually like when you go through it? Um, Jamie, would you like to start? Sure. So I, have, I can take in about three new concepts at once. As soon as it goes over that, it goes horribly wrong, and I can't keep up. So I'll start mixing things up. So for example, if someone's introducing this character and this character, oh, and this weapon, and this place, and this location, then you'll go, I'm already lost. And then I start feeling really freaking stupid, mm -hmm. because I can't keep up with what's happening. And there's, there's a fair few games I've ended up just turning off because of how they make me feel, because I couldn't keep up. There's another example as well, which is like the first opening six minutes of The Lord of the Rings. The way we ended up tackling that was to watch it one minute at a time and then to write down the things and draw a mind map because mm -hmm. I just couldn't, couldn't take in the concepts quickly enough. So one of the things to consider when you're designing games is that, um, that kind of curve of introducing concepts. The other side of it is um, games are slowly getting more and more of these concepts that don't really relate to anything. So there's a, a rally game called V-Rally. I can do the driving, really enjoy the driving, but it wants me to recruit people and build a team and that's beyond my head, so I can't play that game. I've tried and tried, but I've just, got, I've just now go and play time trial mode. Now, if they just had a button that said, bugger off and do the defaults, I'd be fine. So that's kind of the big ones for me. Is it's just too many concepts, too quickly, not enough processing time, and I'm out of there, and I'm going to go do something else or go for a sleep. Mm -hmm. Jerry? Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. I might change my answer because the, to the one I made notes on because... I have a feeling we might all say the same thing, and so I'm trying to. I usually talk about audio, but it's everything for me. Like, I'm going to be really honest. It's everything. Like, it's really everything. Mm -hmm. God, I always say I won't get emotional. Um, this is the place to do it. <laughs> Jacob is very special to me, so it makes me extra emotional. <laughs> um, it's really hard to feel stupid when you know you're not. Mm -hmm. And I think we're very intelligent people and we're very good at our jobs. And now I understand game design on a really fundamental level. Like being a designer makes you understand these things. And even when you know how a game is made and what contributed to that process and you still stumble because you're just being overloaded. And then on top of that, I was actually gonna wait to talk about this until Accessibility Toronto this week, but I'm just gonna do it now. We talk about impact, but we talk about it in a really abstract way. Meltdowns are really hard. And I've never talked about this publicly, but they're very embarrassing, and they cause me a lot of shame and guilt, and I have no control over myself, and I lose control of my body. And I'm a grown person, and I shouldn't do that, but it happens. And video games do that to me, even though I love them. And that's why I always want people to understand is that it's not always about can and can't. It's sometimes it's just about impact. And being overloaded, that's what that does to me. Like Spider-Man, I tried to love that game because it was so successful on an accessibility front. And I was so proud of the industry of again to that point. But for me, it was awful. It made me feel stupid. It made me feel stressed. It made me feel uncomfortable. I couldn't get the concepts. I couldn't understand, and that's why I went to systems design, because for me, the core systems of a game is where we can have the most impact on players and improve their lives so much. So it's things like skill trees and character progression and the way mission design is done and the way these systems are introduced to the player, the way controls are designed. All of these designs are so powerful. And if we just approach it from the right lens of who our players are, what they can and can't do, what their experiences are, what that impact is, and what challenge really is for everyone, that's when we can have the most impact. And so, for me, that's where I really focus on is trying to introduce those in more helpful ways, in more gentle ways, in ways that don't come 10 concepts at once. Where, like, Spider Man interrupted me about 100 times with a new mission all the time. Like, I was trying to get from place to place, and it was like, oh, you've got a phone call. Oh, you've got a, a 
please chase. And I just, it was so overloading and it was just, yeah, really, really emotional. Another concrete example as well, um, which is something that I had all the way through primary school, which is where people much younger than you overtake you in being able to do something. Mm -hmm. So for example, I can't remember what game I was playing, it was something on the Switch. And like my 90, uh, I was, you know, 12? What, what age did they start secondary school? She's I that old. I don't remember. She's secondary school years old. Um, I don't know what secondary school yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> it's like high school, but worse. Oh, okay. um, high school, all right. Uh, also, distractibility. Oh yeah, so when my niece started being able to outperform me in certain games and was having to explain to Jamie how to do things, that was very infantilizing. Mm -hmm. And you're sat there going, I'm a freaking research engineer. Millions of people use my code every day, but what does that button do? Right. I can't remember. You just told me, but I can't remember. So that can have a real emotional kind of kick in the gut. Yeah. And then it makes you want to back away from things so yeah. you don't get into that position. In the That's place. actually what saved Spider-Man for me. The one thing that kept me in Spider-Man was they had a list of all the moves. And just being able to go to that, once I discovered that, mm -hmm. I helped me deal with all the other overload because I knew that that was there. It was like a safety net and it made me feel more capable and like I wasn't the problem. Like, so that's the important part for me. There's another cheat for this as well, which is I'll, I'll wave at him because he sat there looking bored. <laughs> um, so Ollie is one of the people who supports me, make sure I don't get run over. I've recently been playing Zelda Link's Awakening and I got stuck. So given that Ollie has lots of downtime, I gave it to him. He's played it all the way through and now when I get stuck, I've got a walking ball through. So, you know, there are some strategies that are quite effective. I'm trying to get an Ollie. I just, I, yeah. no one's picking up my calls. I'm like, how do you, how he's do you waving at acquire you? another? I need another one. I'm not going to take your Ollie. Oh, okay. He's available, very reasonable rates. <laughs> do, you, do you rent him out? Are you like, no, no, he rents himself out. Oh, okay. Wait, I was like, don't have to. We don't need to go down that path. His rates are very reasonable. <laughs> Raining it back in. Oh my God, you guys are hilarious. Um, Sorry. No, no, I totally resonate with that concept of feeling like I'm an intelligent human. Like, I, I know things. Like, I do things. And not being able to play a game. And there are so many games that I just have never picked up. And I probably never will. Like, I say, I don't play games with guns. That's a political thing. I mean, you guys know what's going on in America right now. I don't play games with guns. But I, the types of games that are gun-oriented are so overwhelming and overstimulating that they don't even appeal to me on a preference level. So I was always like, oh, I just don't like those games. Oh, I don't like those games. And then as I learned more about accessibility, learned more about how my brain works, I realized, do I not like those because I just am not interested or because I know they're going to be really unpleasant for me. So where does that puzzle piece fit together? And I know when I'm streaming, you know, you've got chat running, you've got interactives, you've got all kinds of things going on, and, and the cognitive load of being able to remember certain things, it's embarrassing sometimes. I have dyscalculia, so I'm numbers, I always say numbers are nonsense. So for me, you know, not being able to understand time and how numbers work on stream in front of people, it's embarrassing. I'm like, I'm a grown ass woman. And like, you know, like I have a college degree, damn it. You know, and not being able to read numbers on stream because that's a perfect example of when the cognitive load is, is high and, and cherry streams as well and understands where it's just like, you know, you, you're like, I, I'm not dumb. I'm just being made to feel dumb. So walking away from games is something like Jamie mentioned. I do, I will never go back. Like you made me feel stupid, I'm done. And there are so many games where I'm like, the first three levels were fun, kind of. And then I hit level four, and then I'm like never going to go back ever again. So I'd love to do that. I'd love to talk to developers like, this is why I left your game and never will go back. Because it's important to know, like, where are people with cognitive disabilities hitting those barriers to the point where they never want to go back? Jamie? Um, this is one of, the, one of the major changes for me was about how I thought about myself. So this is where the social model comes in. Mm -hmm. So I used to see myself as having a defect, a flaw. I had a disability. It was a thing that I had that was a flaw with me. But actually what it is, is people are missing my requirements when they design systems, and then I'm encountering barriers in those systems. So it's not me that's broken, it's the system that's broken, and then I can be proactive and help them improve it. And what you do to help me when I'm really derpy will also help someone who's tired or in a hurry. <laughs> Absolutely. So changing that mental frame from the problem is with me to the problem with the thing that's being designed was really important for me just being a happier person. Yeah, and that's applicable to designers and developers as well when you're thinking about your design problems. It's not your users are special or broken. They're people who just have needs that might not be what other people's <laughs> needs are. And all needs are different. 
Stephen, do you have a great example of what you know? What do you deal with? I want to know. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I suppose um, a really good example of that is that technology over the last even even five years is you've always had to be a slave to technology. So whether that's input in, input out, always certain criteria. Like with things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, like what's coming in now, it's actually technologies are bending around the person and the human, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. So technology is now becoming a slave to the person who's programming it. So from the games like Spider-Man, different things, if there was actually better integrated AI and machine learning to actually understand the gameplay from the person straight from them up, the actual process to get into levels can actually potentially be a little bit slower, but it can actually be much more engaging to keep the people in. Mm -hmm. Imagine learning a language um, as an adult. Um, <laughs> as imagine learning a language from someone who's got dyspraxia who can't break down words all phonetically. And imagine going through like a Duolingo process where if you can't say the word, you can't actually get through the level. So therefore, you actually need a simpler word to say. Mm -hmm. So actually, yeah, why isn't that concept actually been coming into gaming in a much more effective process as well? Mm -hmm. And you think this is not necessarily just helping people with disabilities, it's also helping children, you know, get into games a lot earlier as well. Mm -hmm. Can I just advertise BBC Games? Mm -hmm. We do exactly that. We have a requirement about uh, adjustable... Um, Gareth's going to look at me now and I need to... I'm asking yeah. to remember the name of a guideline on stage. That's a terrible idea. It's like an adjustable game. So if we've got a platformer and any user is failing to make the jump three times, we, we silently make the platform a little bit bigger. Bless things like that. that. Because yeah. what we're aiming for yeah. is a fun and enjoyable flow, mm -hmm. not necessarily a, a, a black and white line between completion and failure. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's, that's a like really good design technique. Not actually a children's game at all. Hellblade Center was Sacrifice did that really, really well. British Studio, Ninja Theory. They had intelligent AI-driven difficulty. They didn't have difficulty options. They had a difficulty that would respond to the player and how well the player was doing. And it made the game feel so, like it was such a flow and it was so seamless and it didn't make you feel patronized or like you were failing. Mm -hmm. um, it just adjusted as, as you failed, it corrected itself a little bit as you went. And, or then if you started to do better, as a lot of people do once they learn the systems, then mm -hmm. it got harder, which was really, really satisfying. Yeah, and that's a great lead into our next um, question which is about barriers. So, you know, I've played a game that I really wish I could have kept playing. I, you know, it's, it was a little bit too much cognitive for me, but I maybe would love to go back to it. Um, but Way of the Passive Fist, which was designed with accessibility incredibly in mind. And you're able to determine, it's a side-scroller fighting game, so you're able to determine how many players can approach you, how many enemies can approach you at once. And I cranked it all the way down because that's so overstimulating because you have to memorize their patterns and the buttons to know what button you have to push at a certain time to block. And I'm not a fighting game person, which everybody who plays fighting games is like, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, that's fighting games. But what was really great was I was able to tailor those to where I was at cognitively at that time. And then when I got the hang of it, I was able to bump it up once. And then I was like, oh, shit, no, and then bumped it back down. But you know, <laughs> it had those tailor abilities. But there are certain kinds of games that I will never be able to pick up, as I mentioned earlier. Like, they just have so many barriers for me. Um, you know, but we understand at the same time, some <laughs> games aren't for everybody. And that's something that everybody on the stage, we fully understand. There are, like, I will never be a Souls-like person, ever. My partner, that is all my, my partner loves. I have no desire to burst through that grueling, like I don't get self-satisfaction, like that's not enough to drive me, is like, you did it, yeah. Like I feel that way about taking my trash out. Like I don't, <laughs> like, I didn't get my electric turned off because I remembered to pay my bills because remembering those kind of cognitive tasks are difficult. So, you know, the grueling task of beating your face against the wall, which is the soul's like, I find no joy in that. So that game will never be for me, um, personally, but, I'm wondering for you guys, um, are there any types of games that you guys would love to play? Um, maybe they just have too many barriers that could be changed. Uh, Cherry mentioned some games that just had some things that had decisions been made differently, you could have played them. Um, are there any games like that for you, Stephen? Can you start yeah. off? Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, things like um, the most recent Mortal Kombat um, as well was so much fun to play. However, it felt very limited. There's only a certain amount of button bashing, which is a, you know, which is a very enjoyable way of mm -hmm. gaming you can do before you have to get in much more complex skills. 
One of the interesting ways that I suddenly learned about it to learn patterns was that to use the Xbox uh, adaptive controller with uh, additional mm. buttons. So I was able to do buttons with my feet as well as my hands mm. and as well as my fingers. So suddenly gaming became much more accessible for me because I was able to input it differently. So it's not always necessarily about UX design, it's always that thing which you hold as well, um, which is was so important for me, and, and especially with um, co-piloting, so playing with my nephew and my go godson. It's just a really interesting way of actually able to come together to actually really enjoy gaming, which is necessarily accessible for them. So think about how more than one person can actually play on one controller as well, because um, a lot of games now you can't split screen, you know, for instance, mm -hmm. which is uh, gaming's getting more social, but it's also becoming a little bit more antisocial mm -hmm. as well. So actually, how can those things actually come together much more effectively? Mm -hmm. I think for me, like Jamie mentioned earlier, I can connect my Switch controller to a PC, which opened up so many games for me because I cannot keyboard game. Um, my anecdotal comment that I always say is I played Ori in the Blind Forest platformer on PC. 16 hours of gameplay of me being like, I'm going to persevere, I'm going to persevere, I'm going to do it. 16 hours of gameplay, I did it in three with a, with a Switch controller. And it was, I was like, I'm never, ever going back. I'm not dumb. I'm not a bad player. This just doesn't work for me. And by getting my uh, Pro Controller connected, and Steam did accept Pro Controllers at that time, finally, um, I was able to map it, and I was able to play and crush it. And it was a great, and I had such a great time, and now I'm obsessed with Metroidvanias. <coughs> but I never would have been able to access those games had I not controller mapped. So that was a really big, you know, eye-opening, like, oh my gosh, like, this is everything I've ever needed. Now I can play Steam games? Like, it was great having my partner help me controller because I'm, I'm an indie player. Like, that's what I love. I love indie games. Um, they're creative, they're beautiful, and they're brilliant. And I love, there's so many games that I've never been able to play, but now, you know, marshmallow hot tub game, hell yeah, I'm going <laughs> to map those controls and I'm going to play the marshmallow hot tub game that I love. So there's games that, you know, they're silly, they're quirky, they're small, that I now have access to. What about you, Cherry? Um, I'm going to try to be really quick. So I'm really um, different to Shell and maybe even everyone else on the panel. I punish myself. <laughs> I don't ever give up. Um, probably why I'm here. <laughs> um, I really love Souls likes, <laughs> which is like, it doesn't make any sense because they're like, in some ways they're really inaccessible games, but some, say, some ways they're actually really accessible games. Like just being able to change the audio means that I can pull all that really distressing sound down and suddenly I can be better than almost any other Souls player. Like, sorry, but it's true. Um, <laughs> so, like, I didn't actually know how good I was until I was streaming it and people were like, you have beaten these Bloodborne bosses in two attempts. What is going on? And I was like, <laughs> it's not, you just learn the patterns. It's just patterns. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm really good at patterns. Um, so, for me, a weird one that I would love to play because I love watching other people play and it's so relaxing to watch other people play, but I tried to play it and I just couldn't, is the one time where it can and can't is a thing for me, is Stardew Valley. Mm -hmm. The time limits, the menial tasks, like the numbers of menial tasks, the lists you have to keep in your head, your massive inventory that you cannot sort, and it's just full of overwhelming stuff. Mm -hmm. All the people you have to remember that's going to be here on this day, and there on that day, and there on the other day, and you have to remember what they look like, but they all look the same, because they're all like eight pixels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and but like, I had to make a port for that. Right. Like, people were like, this is overwhelming. Right, and I was also trying to play it on keyboard and mouse, and I cannot play keyboard either cognitively and physically. Um, I can't hold my hand out for very long. I, my hand's go back to claw shapes, which is controller shapes, conveniently. Um, <laughs> but keyboards also cognitively, even though I grew up with keyboard playing, now suddenly since my strokes don't make any sense to me, I get confused about where the letters are, um, which is really awkward, typing emails. But um, yeah, Stardew Valley, God, I'd love to play that game because mm -hmm. I love watching other people. It's I just so cute. sit on Twitch watching people play that game all day. <laughs> I don't, I work, I promise. <laughs> Jamie? Um, Stardew Valley was another game I couldn't get into, same reason. Um, and s alarmingly, almost every game genre is slowly becoming harder and harder for me to play yeah. mm -hmm. because there's just so much faff and tat. Yeah. Like the racing games where you need to manage a garage or Forza Horizon. Here are your skill points, Trey. Oh, fuck off. Mm -hmm. It really... <laughs> I'm here to drive the car. Anything that is not driving the car can take a hike. Mm -hmm. Take a hike, is that polite enough? 
Okay. Good, still not fired. You already said fuck off, it's fine. Oh, yeah, good yeah, point. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Damn. <laughs> um, so specific genres I'd love to get into would be real-time strategy games. When I was a kid, I used to love Command & Conquer Red Alert because yes. it was very straightforward. Yes. I tried to play uh, some Warhammer one the other day, and I was just like, a what? A tau? Okay, that's great. That's a mathematical symbol to do with ratios. And Oh, no, that's an alien race now. Okay. So redefining words that I know from other contexts and then throwing them at me was just driving me crazy. It just had so much complexity that I was like, I just want to point my men to go and shoot at that thing. Please? So real-time strategy games, if they were simpler. Mm -hmm. um, Command & Conquer was actually the first time I hacked any files. Yeah? Yeah, it was really fun. No. Mm -hmm. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> um, I actually hold... A, I have a PlayStation 1, and it's the console that I probably play more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Things like the original Colin McRae Rally, many older games. They're just simpler, and I really love the fact that when you want to play it, you put the disc in and press the button, and it doesn't connect to the internet. Nothing updates. Mm -hmm. It just works. And then when you lose, you press and hold the reset button because <laughs> it hasn't written it to the memory card yet. Yep. Safe's coming! Yeah. <laughs> it's accessibility it's called. feature. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, so slowly more and more game genres are getting harder for me rather than easier. So it'd be nice if game developers started just trying to, you know, even if you're giving me a simplified mode, that's fine. Let me focus on the core gameplay and make the rest of the faff disagree, disappear. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and, and just said it, the insistence of having in-game in advertising as well. And that's mm -hmm. so like, overwhelming and completely needless the whole thing. Mm -hmm. That was like my flight here. Suddenly Air Canada advertised Ugh. to you. Oh, it was aggressive. While they're doing like the safety stuff. Mm -hmm. and just like, oh, uh, uh, and you mm -hmm. can't turn it off. Nope. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, carry on. Mm -hmm. yeah, just <laughs> tangents. I was there too. We were, we were across the plane from each other, but I was like, this is a real life post op hide issue, wicked for us web nerds. And I was like, I can't, like every screen is on, every screen is moving. And, and I'm like, light, the ah. lights, the colored lights, mm -hmm. and they're so bright. Mm -hmm. Changing, having lights in the color palettes, being able to change, that is something that affects us. A lot of us are really sensitive to blue light. It causes migraines for me from a brain injury. And like those simple things, like they're really important to us. So we've talked a lot about, you know, a little bit of like barriers, a little bit about some wins, but um, for the last question on the panel, um, I'd love to ask about, were there any like games that you played recently or things that you have, you know, experienced recently game-wise that where accessibility wins, where access wins, um, be it, you know, like, like we talked about earlier, where it wasn't necessarily an accessibility setting, but something that delighted you and brought you joy. Stephen, anything that you've had recently? Uh, one was actually Forza Horizon. Mm -hmm. um, it was um, to ask what to do next, because um, you're just driving through a bunch of fields not knowing what to do, or uh, you could just end up just driving aimlessly for ages. So uh, actually having suggestions of go here, race here, was actually one of the good appetites. I know that's been in the game for ages, but suddenly it had been in a very complex game like that was very good. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, it's so important. Those, those hint levels are so yeah. important, depending on where you are cognitively. Jamie gives a great example in your talk. Um, I couldn't remember the game. It's when they, they have a wipe on the wall of paint. And depending on the difficulty level, it becomes like that's stronger to see. Tomb Raider. Tomb Raider. Well, that's a brilliant because sometimes I can't see color very well, and yeah. sometimes I can't read very well. It just depends on where we're at. And for me, I would say when it comes to a game or something that I was delighted with is I played. Um, I had the access to a game called Hyperdot. It's an indie game. If you're going to the Toronto conference, there'll be a presenter there. But they did a ton of accessibility research and they talked to disabled gamers and I was one of the gamers they picked to stream it and they paralleled data calculations about where you were at your progress which is awesome progress indicators to give expectations to users holy cow but by showing a graph and a chart for me alongside the numbers it was amazing I could see when you lose, they tell you how close you were to winning, which is great to know, like, oh, I just missed it by this much. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's time-based, but it's so well designed in the aspect of if you don't do numbers, you can still really achieve success in the game and know where you're at because they had load bars and different, and, like, they were, it was brilliant, and I loved it because I, as I'm streaming it, I read the numbers. The numbers are all wrong. My mod, like, pings me, like, hey, like, you, like those aren't the numbers. And I was like, oh, I mess all the numbers up, but I have the, I have the bar, so I know where I'm at. It doesn't matter that I switched around all the numbers. I'm good. So I really enjoyed that. Cherry? Um, yeah, I actually worked on that project. I was one mm -hmm. of the researchers, so thank you. She's why I did it, so, you know. Thank you to everyone <laughs> they, that, like, took part in that, because mm -hmm. 
it was the players that really made that research project and it was like hugely successful so please come talk to me about it because I really want the whole industry to take that idea and just steal it from me. <laughs> um, and the Glitch team, who are amazing, who we simultaneously had a similar idea, and then somehow we came together at E3, and they were like, I have this idea. And I was like, oh my god, this is like this idea I've had for ages. And <laughs> it was great. <laughs> um, so that actually, my wins are mostly under NDA. Um, Damn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my friend Zoe, who was in Tara's talk, one of the reasons I am a game developer now, because I've known her for almost 20 years, and she really inspired me to get into the industry, but back in the day, she told me, when you work in games, you don't have time to play games. And like, I understood that, like I know what those words mean. It wasn't until I worked in games, I was like, shit, how real that is? <laughs> I have such a backlog. And like, people keep giving me games for free now. And like, <laughs> now I don't even have time to play them. It's the money and so, like. All these wins that everyone else had this year, I just enjoyed them vicariously through the community because part of my job is to be really connected to the community. And so those are my wins, is the community and seeing everyone else getting emotional and excited about the games they can suddenly play or play with less impact on them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that wasn't my answer, but that is my answer. Is and also Falcon Age is great, so everyone should play that because uh -huh. the thing about Falcon Age, I'm just going to really quickly say this. Their Twitter is amazing and hilarious, so just yeah. follow them. Yeah, yeah. Their developer is hilarious. <laughs> so I trained to be a falconer before I was physically in a wheelchair. Um, and now you can't be a falconer when you're in a wheelchair because everything's grass um, and fields and mountains. And so this game was very special to me because it took those menial tasks that I have a really hard time with and I hate, and it turned it into me having a bird friend who went and fetched things for me and did all the cool stuff for me and that was a big win for me. Mm -hmm. Cool. Because if we're being honest, there's somebody in this room who gave me a free game to try. Uh, I won't name them and I won't name the game. And it was on Origin. And if I'm honest, I couldn't get around, I couldn't work out how to install Origin, so it's still yet to be redeemed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. You didn't name the game, but I mean, there's not many games that are on Origin. Yeah. Ooh, stick burn. <laughs> um, <laughs> we appreciate That's your a very character. specific company. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway. On. So, games, I've got a nice story to end on. So, um, I play uh, Horde mode with my friends. Mm -hmm. And um, up until now, I've always played as a sniper. Because what would happen is if I played any other, any other role, it would turn into the picking Jamie up off the floor game, because I'd constantly die. Um, and then what would happen is I'd play as a sniper, and a friend of mine would play as the engineer. And we invented the playpen of death, which is when you have a sniper, you surround them with barriers and turrets, because otherwise they die constantly, because your sniper is rubbish. So we had to adapt our gameplay to make it accessible to me. And it meant that other people had to take certain roles. With Gears of War 5, there's an aim assist, which means I'm now starting to play as a scout and a soldier. And I've stopped playing as a sniper. Because I've stopped playing as a sniper, my friends stopped playing as an engineer. And we're exploring whole new ways of playing the game. And it stopped becoming the stop Jamie from dying game and the bloody, for crying out loud, Jamie's most valuable player again. Woo! <laughs> so that social aspect has been, has been huge. And all it was was a, a one accessibility option that I tried one day when I was feeling quite spaced out. I was going to sit the game out, but I was like, oh, well, I saw it on Twitter. I'll give it a go and let's see. And mm -hmm. it's completely changed the game for me. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how one setting can be make or break, one that's, option. That's like Apex Legends. I always wanted to play Battle Royale. I like observed from afar. I was like, well, that looks so much fun. I would love to play it with my friends that love those games. But Fortnite, no way. Like, there's so many buttons and so many things to do. Building, what? Mm -hmm. um, and Apex Legends, first of all, is my aesthetic, 100%. But then that ping system, I saw that, I was like, instantly, I know I can do this. Because the problem for me is, like, I cannot be verbal. I am very verbal up here and in a particular space, but there are times where I am nonverbal. <coughs> Most of those times is when my cognitive load is really intense or when I'm very tired. And being able to play without voice chat, but still communicate in an instant with one button mm -hmm. what I need my friends to know changed everything. Mm -hmm. I know when I'm streaming Minecraft these days, which I never thought I'd ever play Minecraft, so talking about it later, it's a problem. Um, but having narrator narrate my chat for me is amazing. I, you know, I'm, I'm streaming, I'm streaming, and um, I'm able to have it read out loud for me, which is just 
you know, takes that load off of me when I have my mods, you know, playing with me in the game, which is fantastic. So to end this um, lovely discussion, because we are at time, um, I hope today you guys learned a little bit more about how diverse cognitive disabilities are, even though I said we have a lot of overlaps, um, and how sometimes when you think about usability, you're actually thinking about cognitive accessibility, because we're the people that forget our passwords. We're the people that forget your controllers and your controls and how, they, how to be played. We're the people who need those settings. And we want to buy your games, and we want to play your games. Um, I will ask, as we wrap up, if you will refrain from clapping, and we will just do the beautiful jazz hands instead. Um, so, but that is our talk. Um, let me go to the last slide. Uh, that has our contact information up, and we'll leave it up. Um, but thank you guys for being here. We appreciate your time, and we hope you guys enjoy lunch. So thank you, guys.